We're happy to welcome you to the IAPO Global Vision Conference of 2020. Um, the mental health session is we have here our esteemed speak from very great institutions. The GPC 2020 is an opportunity for us to start rebuilding and strengthen our health systems and to co-create safe, innovative, robust health systems and uh, have the future proofed against any upcoming health-related emergency. My name is B.C. Bright. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Live Well Initiative LWI in Nigeria, a non-profit patient organization. Today on this session, we have, like I said much earlier, three esteemed speakers. I'll introduce them very quickly, and then I'll tell you in what order they will speak. We have here Dr. Kanan Subramaniam of the Pfizer of John. He's a global um, entrepreneur and a, a top lead, a global lead in the Pfizer of John chain. And he's going to tell us a different angle of mental health as we had this pandemic, which we've never even thought about. Next, when he's done, we will have a very esteemed intellectual of the Oxford University in the United Kingdom, Professor Kamal Dibwe, who also doubles as the editor-in-chief of the British Journal of Psychiatry and a college editor. And once he's done talking about um, the mental health and pandemic, then we will have Annie Bliss, a lovely lady who heads the Alzheimer's um, organization in the United Kingdom. You are all welcome once more. And then I would, I'm happy to inform you that you can submit your questions via the Q&A portal. And every attendee uh, will be allowed to vote for questions they consider more relevant to this debate in case we find that we are running out of time. So we of my great privilege, I'm happy to give the floor to Dr. Kernan Subramanian, a global entrepreneur of the Pfizer of John Chain. Thank you. Dr. Subramanian, please, you are muted. Can you please unmute uh, can yourself? Un unmute. Thank can you, you please Bissi. unmute yourself and you can share your slides. Thank you. Thank you, Bissi. I'd like to um, thank uh, Kaul Deep and the board of IOPO for this opportunity to speak to you all. And uh, good morning and good evening, everyone. My name is Kanan Subramaniam. I'm the medical lead for the NCD strategy for emerging markets with Pfizer Up John. As Bissi introduced to me, I'm going to talk to you about mental health, uh, give you an overview about before and after the pandemic of COVID-19. And let me just share my screen with you. So to start off, um, one of the things I'd like to reiterate is what uh, Dr. Swaminathan said this morning uh, about NCDs. So um, mental health before the pandemic. We have four key NCD groups of diseases that form non-communicable diseases. And along with that, mental health is a major challenge for us. 71% of all deaths are the result of these four NCDs. That's 41 million people in the year 2014, and that's every year. Of these, 15 million are premature deaths, that is, they're occurring between the ages of 39 and 70. And 85% of these occur in the low and middle income countries, the most vulnerable populations and the most impoverished populations that we have. And let's not forget, almost a million people die from suicide each year. So the United Nations has a sustainable development goal of by 2030 to reduce by one third premature deaths from NCDs by prevention and treatment of NCDs and promoting mental health and well-being. However, uh, the most recent NCD countdown is showing that most countries are not progressing well on this target. And this is a challenge. And this is what we have even before the pandemic hit us. Now, I have borrowed a slide from um, the um, WHO, which really tells us that business is not usual. There's a deadly interplay between COVID-19 and NCDs, 
NCDs. And this has brought us to a very, very crucial juncture. There was a lot of progress uh, between 2000 and 2010, where there was a, a decline in the risk of dying, particularly the premature death from a major NCD. And the progress started dwindling between in the last decade from 2010 to 2019. Uh, the incremental decline was very small and there was an increase in diabetes. However, the outbreak has really put a spanner in the works. People with NCDs are much more vulnerable to becoming more severely ill or even dying from COVID-19. And that's not everything, because we will see shortly in another slide that COVID-19 and the repurposing of healthcare workforce has had disruption to services. And it's not just the repurposing, but also the preventative measures that we put in place to uh, control the um, COVID-19 pandemic. So we're at a critical junction now. And uh, let's look at how we can actually change this, because as a consequence of chronic underfunding in mental health, there's resulted a shortage of psychiatrists, psychologists, nurses, and allied health workers, such as social workers, in most low and middle income countries. Now, you, a lot of you would have seen this graph before, because this really shows you the phases of the pandemic and how it impacts on healthcare. So if you look at um, phase one, that was the immediate mortality and morbidity of COVID-19, which occurred around March. And in the second phase, there was an impact of the resource restriction. So non-COVID-19 conditions were not being looked at. And therefore, you know, uh, there was an impact on chronic care and CD care. So which led to the third phase, which was the impact of interrupted care on particularly on vulnerable communities, including those with mental health conditions and chronic conditions such as cardiovascular disorder and the other NCDs. But the fourth phase, which we will lead into following the pandemic, is, is going to have a significant impact, predicted to have a significant impact on uh, mental health with the psychic trauma due to the pandemic, the economic injury and the burnout. Now there's some emerging data on mental health issues already, uh, risks that we are already aware of. Uh, uh, the um, YouGov group in uh, Australia have shown what is really stressing us the most. So if you look at it, 71% are stressed about not seeing friends. 77% uh, are not stressed about not seeing family. Almost half the population surveyed showed that they were really stressed about losing their job. And this, is a, this has a significant impact. Um, Professor Felicity Goodyear-Smith and the University of Auckland have been uh, doing panels of uh, studies over the past um, little while. And um, the latest monthly July-August survey results show that 73%, there's a report of increase in mental health presentations to general practice and 20% report a decrease in wellness and chronic care visits. This, this just shows the trends that are emerging for mental health issues. The unemployment rate is closely related to the relative risk of suicide. The mean unemployment rate and the estimated relative risk of suicide are shown in these two graphs. So you can see we're really, we're really at a sort of a perfect storm for mental health issues, not just for people with mental health um, problems, but also people who are generally well, but are going to uh, face psychic trauma. So this is not just for low and middle income countries. This is a global issue. Now, uh, these two graphs show uh, the um, high income countries from the United States to Norway and, and the COVID's impact on mental health is shown here. Pandemic causes a spike in common mental health disorders such as anxiety and depression. So the uh, orange bars are from January to June in 2019, and the red bars are from May to uh, May 14th to 19th, you know, almost at the, at the epicenter of the pandemic in, in um, the early countries. And you can see there's a significant rise in uh, symptoms of anxiety, symptoms of depressive disorder. So there are some issues that are compounded. For a long time, we continue to have this. There's a lack of understanding. When it's a physical illness, we, we recognize it very well. We actually um, get people to get seek help, so it's not a problem. 
but the stigma of mental health and our lack of understanding makes it even more difficult. So what can we do? Um, various organizations have got um, very good uh, psychological first aid. And this psychological first aid bolsters resilience. I, I, I want to emphasize the resilience because during past um, trauma, such as emergencies like the Boxing Day tsunami that affected a lot of Asia, 50% um, of the people who were affected managed to get over their post-traumatic stress syndrome, which did not lead to a disorder through um, psychological first aid. So coping with COVID-19, this is a um, very good six pieces of information from the National Institute of Mental Health in the US, taking breaks from the news. We are inundated with news about COVID. So taking breaks is important. Taking care of your body, exercise, healthy habits are very important. Having time to unwind is, is crucial um, because the stress of normal life, particularly working from home for most people, you need the time to unwind. Connecting with others, Zoom is, and other uh, modalities are a useful way to connect with others. But also getting some order into your life, setting goals, priorities, and focusing on facts that are provided by reputable agencies like the WHO, the CDC, is really important. Oh, here's another um, set of guidance from the Australian government. Similar, um, seek support, follow facts, um, talk, don't type. And that's a really important um, uh, advice for psychological first aid. Financial stress is real. So talk about it. And, and we need to manage our finances as we go forward, particularly those whose uh, jobs are restricted or are fear of leaving, um, losing their jobs. But as an organization uh, with UpJohn, uh, we are partnering to lead the conversation because no one, uh, this, this is a quote from uh, Dr. Amrit Ray, who will, you will be hearing from more, no one can afford to be a bystander here. But at the end of the day, we cannot do it alone. Uh, we are partnering with Ineco Foundation in Mexico on the Yellow September campaign, which is depression without stigma. Uh, we have already worked with um, um, IOPO member, which is the Malaysia um, Organization for Mental Health, Miasa Malaysia, and uh, they have done some very useful uh, webinars using Facebook, corralling their members, but also uh, other modalities to use webinars. The impact of the lockdown on mental health was a recent webinar they've done. So uh, we are partnering with these organizations to deliver uh, how you can actually prevent um, the impact of COVID-19 on mental health. With that short talk, I'd just like to leave you with um, what the WHO has said. COVID-19 actually impacts us, all of us, and will take all of us working together to overcome this challenge. So stay active, stay focused, and on the end game is the important thing for us to be stay focused. Now, these, will, these slides will be available to you after the um, uh, conference, and uh, these links will take you to some useful articles. Thank you for listening today. Thank you, Busy. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Subramaniam. Very aptly covered. Um, you really covered everything. You started by telling us that 71% of our deaths are caused by NCDs. And then you went on to talk about the impact of COVID um, on health and well-being as being a, a global challenge and not just a local one. Complicated further by stigma, stigmatization and their lack of general understanding. That, those were very great points. And then you, you, you also ended up by advising us to take a break from the news. I think many of us stay glued to the news. You want to hear the latest figures on COVID. So Dr. Supermanian has advised us to please take a break from the news and uh, you know, uh, talk with, connect with others, link up with family members, unwind, set new goals, and move forward in a different way. Thank you so much. And um, I like the hashtag yeah, in this together. That's a very good one you gave us, uh, Dr. Supermanian. Thank you very much. Now I'm happy to introduce once more to us a very esteemed uh, facilitator and lecturer in psychiatry at the top British University, the Oxford University, Professor Kamal Bidwi. He's a man I respect very much. There's a phrase I had um, 
uh, to state with him, which I'll mention at the end of his speech. I'm going to look out if he will say it here today. So, Professor Bui, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to speak today at this esteemed Congress. Thank you to Kabaldeep for the invitation. Thank you to my colleagues also for contributing to this seminar. It's a great pleasure um, to talk to you today about ethnic inequalities in severe mental illness and how the COVID pandemic has really made what was already a difficult situation worse. <coughs> I want to talk a little bit about the history of ethnic inequalities in severe mental illness and there are data around the globe uh, showing these inequalities uh, and then talk a little bit about what this means for our society, for our institutions and for our institutional and interpersonal care processes. So the background is that we've known about ethnic inequalities in severe mental illness, the higher incidence in minorities and the marginalised and migrants for three, four, five, six decades. We know they have poorer experiences of care and face greater adversity in society and have poorer outcomes. We also know that they experience more coercive care, uh, for example, care under the Mental Health Act of respected countries. They have more criminal justice system involvement, less often opportunities for psychological and social interventions. And although in some areas they have higher referral rates to psychological interventions, they show less adherence and have poorer outcomes. There are many different explanations. One of them is cultural variations in assessment processes. Uh, discriminatory processes, variations in cultural practices which lead people to seek help in different ways which may lead to delays. Even the constructions of what is illness and what is recovery differ in different cultural contexts and these may play a part. Also the marginalised and those living in precarious situations uh, also have more complex presentations, particularly for example if they experience trauma they will have complex presentations. There's very little assessment of personality difficulties across cultural groups. Maybe we need to be from the same cultural group to make such judgments, but also maybe the diagnostic criteria aren't sensitive to cultural variations. We know of variations in health beliefs and explanatory models also. We also know that place is very important. There are higher rates of schizophrenia in urban settings. We know cluster disadvantage and multiple deprivation is very important. And we know in these spaces, people have poorer trust of authorities and there's less communication with them about what's available to them. And so it's hard to think about all of these unequal outcomes without also thinking about racism and discrimination. And I don't only mean the egregious acts uh, of prejudice, but cumulative and life course adversity and disadvantage in the most marginalized communities and how this marginalization interacts with structural, institutional, interpersonal racism when they encounter care practices. And it's often not the most horrible prejudices, but the low-grade microaggressions, chronic adversity, thwarted aspirations, limited opportunities, which come into play to make people's lives more difficult if they're already in a place of precarity. There have been all, all, already many attempts to resolve these problems, for example, culturally adapting interventions and services, lots of training, cultural competency and capability and race equality training, uh, efforts to transform organisations, uh, recruit uh, people from similar backgrounds and try and improve structural issues in society. There's also a big public health uh, uh, program in, uh, by WHO but also in, in, in any country really trying to aim at prevention, prevention of mental illness. We know half of all mental illnesses are already present by the age of 14 and so if we can prevent early we stand a better chance. We know violence, gender violence, childhood violence and adverse childhood experiences are some of the most horrible risk factors and if we could prevent those we prevent a great deal of uh, mental illness in adulthood. And we know weathering is important. These chronic low-grade adversities if you live in situations of precarity over time age you more. Your biological is age is higher, you're likely to get multi-morbidity and multiple conditions and then you have multiple problems to solve. We need policy and practice which is more aligned and intelligent of all these complexities and we need leadership uh, pledges uh, from national health bodies in the UK it's the NHS we've fortunately secured a pledge from 30 national leaders to do something about the situation in the UK but we need similar actions in other places and we do need place-based interventions what works in one country may not work in another what works in one city may not work in another and we need 
people to be empowered to contribute to the discussions in a true sense of public health, uh, which involves communities as part of the solution rather than simply problematizes them. And then COVID happened. So this was already the case. And then COVID happened. And then we discovered that more minorities die, more of them need intensive care. And this is true even of key workers and frontline people who have professional roles, as in they're not necessarily poor, but over the life course, they've uh, accumulated disadvantages in different ways. They may be very successful, but they've still uh, collected, if you like, more strain over the life course. We also see that some of the narratives that try and explain these disparities focus on the biology, embodied cellular disease, rather than on the societal inequalities, which have been exposed and escalated by the pandemic. Uh, and it's striking that irrespective of social status, if you're from a minority or a marginalized community, you're more likely to encounter complexity in your care, to die early, to need intensive care. So this isn't only about uh, deprivation and, and socioeconomic deprivation, but it is about ethnicity and race, it is about discrimination. We also know that minorities uh, don't respond to public health advice and governments giving them advice from high up. Uh, they don't trust the advice as much, and there's been recent report from the Wellcome Trust in the UK, for example, showing this, and there's poor adherence. Now this lack of trust is not irrational, if they've experienced a lifetime of adversity and historical legacies of adversity as well and disadvantage, they need to be reassured of uh, the messaging that they're getting, particularly if the messaging doesn't come from people like them and isn't cognizant of their daily difficulties that they encounter. We know COVID is going to lead, as Dr. Cannon's already described, to greater levels of poverty and austerity in situations where these are already problematic. Poor mental health problems, financial hardship, unemployment. These are special concerns for those minorities and those living in precarity already. And of course, older populations will have multiple morbidities as well, and that will lead to problems. So what I want to sort of emphasize is that we need to think about the pandemic firstly as, as a wake up call really, that we need to do more about societal disadvantage and inequality. We're already doing a lot, but we're not doing enough. We need to do even more than this is a wake up call for all of us to deal with precarity, migrants, minorities, refugees, and violence to women and children, people living in poverty, child poverty. It's a terrible problem in every society. Uh, even in the high income countries, it's unacceptable. And there are an, there's an absence of any universal care principles. To do this, we need societal solutions, institutional solutions, and interpersonal drivers to tackle inequalities. We need to tackle racism. We need to use the vocabulary that recognizes and motivates people to change what they do in society. To change, politicians and policymakers need to write, use the right vocabulary. So if you say there's a variation, it's not the same as saying there's a disparity and that we need to do something about it. Motivation is one of the biggest problems in tackling inequalities, which we recognize are difficult to talk, talk about. We also know divergent narratives are problematic and you get different solutions and, and there's nothing more that policymakers and politicians like than a divergent narrative because they can't do anything about the problem then. So we need to get some consistency and consensus, consensus about how we solve problems. And those, those narratives have to come from people and their communities. We have to look at societal drivers of inequality, not overly focus on biology. We know that uh, in areas of depth, deprivation, we also lead to what's called syndemics, that is, you're in, in, in places which are sick places because of multiple deprivations and cluster disadvantage, you're more likely to get a disease of any sort. And as soon as you've got one, you're more likely to get a second. And this is an escalating combination and interaction uh, called a syndemic. So therefore, you're more likely to get multiple problems. It's not a surprise, therefore, that COVID strikes mostly at those with already existing comorbidities, so they're already compromised in so many different ways. The most important component of solving this problem is leadership. We need our leadership to be fully engaged with what's required to tackle these societal inequalities, to be intelligent in their solutions, to offer wicked solutions for these wicked problems, and to be emotionally aware and educated, to be courageous about what needs to be done, and to recognize inequity. However, throughout this, we need to listen deeply to people affected. We're not listening hard enough. Their narratives give you all the evidence you need and the answers to how to solve problems. Mental health is central to recovery, central to recovery from COVID, central to recovery from pre-existing problems. Prevention is essential, but it's also central to economic growth and recovery. You cannot have 
uh, economic growth without good mental health in society. Failing to act will lead to poorer recovery and escalation of multiple and cluster disadvantages and diseases and worse outcomes in future pandemics. We need to empower people to enable their resiliency to express itself, but not to rely only on your resiliency to solve problems. We need place-based systems work, progressive policies on welfare and employment and disability rights and discrimination. The pandemic has exposed nothing that we do not already know about in society, albeit we are learning about the virus. It's not sentient, it is not racist. Our social structures are, are what leads to inequality. So we need societal resilience also to tackle inequalities and to prepare for any future natural disasters and uh, second waves if they occur. We need to accommodate the historical legacies to which we're often conditioned and therefore we don't recognise the institutional and structural violence and racism that exists in our institutions and society. These problems sap motivation. We need to use better vocabularies that are not prioritising. We need to make this a, a wake-up call, but also a positive campaign for a better society. Thank you very much for listening. I, I hope uh, some of that was uh, uh, of interest to you and that we can have a discussion later on. Here are some resources you can refer to if you wish to. Here's a list of references also if you want to look at some of the evidence of ethnic inequalities with links which are active. Uh, the slides will be available to you. Thank you ever so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Kamal Dibri. I'm sure the audience is refilled and they're not in any way surprised at the highly intellectual and highly cerebral delivery. I have learned, if I am now an alumnus of the Oxford University after your script, you know, I just quickly summarize a few things I've learned. Um, you talked about um, ethnic inequalities, you talked about health belief models, and um, you know, severe uh, mental illness, and then cultural um, differences, and how cultural adaptation can uh, help mental health. You talked about work for structural issues and a lot of other issues. And then you emphasized the, the precariousness of the situation. You talked about minorities, you talked about immigrants, the poor people, the refugees, the women, the children. You know, vulnerable, the precarity of the vulnerable populations, you emphasize that. And then you thought of a few new words and phrases, which I'm taking home as a part of my swag bag from the GPC. You talked about pandemic, that's a new word I'm hearing today for the first time. You talked about pandemic and multiple mobility. And then you talked about wicked solutions. I really wish we had enough time to go into those wicked solutions. But I could just try and guess what a wicked solution would be. It's a solution, it looks wicked, but it's going to solve the problem. But I, I would learn from you. And then you concluded by telling us to listen deeply to the affected people. And, um, and you emphasize that mental health is very, very central to global recovery, prevention of the um, um, illnesses and so on, and also very central to economic growth. And that summarizes the phrase I was looking for, which I've always known with you, which is, there's no health without mental health. Thank you very much, Professor Green. It's been a privilege listening to you. Thank you. Now, um, to our um, amiable audience, we thank you for your patience. And I would like to introduce uh, our last but not the least speaker, very elegant lady and CEO of the Ozimas Network in the United Kingdom a very young and very brilliant CEO, Annie Bliss. She's going to tell us about um, mental health and the, uh, in relation to the pandemic, especially as it, as it relates to the patient and the automatic. Over to you, Annie. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity to speak um, on this issue. It's very important to um, to be able to raise the profile of dementia within mental health uh, discussions and also particularly around um, what we've seen as a result of the pandemic is um, issues that we've been raising for decades now around um, the lack of access to safe, quality and acceptable healthcare for people living with dementia um, who are now obviously particularly vulnerable during the pandemic. So just to briefly introduce Alzheimer's Disease International, with the Global Federation of Alzheimer's Associations in over 100 countries. Um, and we're in official relations with the World Health Organization and we're also partnered with Dementia Alliance International, who is um, a dementia advocacy group that we work closely with. 
Um, and just to briefly introduce um, the global challenge that we're faced with dementia. Um, there are a new case of dementia every three seconds. Currently, that's 50 million people living with dementia. This will triple by 2050 to 152 million. So it's obviously very big numbers that we're talking about. And um, I think the pandemic has really highlighted kind of the plight of people living with dementia. Um, it also comes with large social and economic costs. So um, it actually is annually costs one trillion US dollars. And that is also going to, to double uh, in the next 30 years. Oh no, sorry, but in the next 10 years, triple in the next 30 years. Um, and that's a lot of that cost is attributed to long-term care. Um, and so I think it's also important as Professor Bury highlighted, the inequalities uh, that are faced by our constituency. Um, in terms of the cases of dementia, there's actually 62% of cases are within women, and that is versus 38% in men. And there's also emerging evidence about um, the disproportionate impact on black, indigenous, and people of color. Um, and, and for example, the issues they have in receiving a diagnosis. So I think that's really important to highlight and, and also um, to, to think about the multimorbidity that many people living with dementia have other non-communicable diseases, and that will be um, especially exacerbated by the current crisis as we see more people uh, developing NCDs as a result. So I first wanted to briefly introduce um, what the distinction is within dementia and mental health. They're very interrelated, but they are, um, it's important to delineate the two. Um, so dementia is the collective name for the group of diseases which cause um, progressive brain degeneration. And that affects things like memory, um, thinking, mood, and then that can in turn affects people's um, relationships and their daily activities. And so dementia is classified as a neurodegenerative disease rather than a mental health condition. That is important to note. Um, but we do see within global health and within policy that dementia is increasingly positioned within mental health. And so at the level of the World Health Organization, there's, um, it, it falls within um, the mental health and substance abuse unit. And they now within that have a kind of a subunit, which is the brain health unit, which is really important for us because um, it highlights that dementia is a, a non-communicable disease, which shares the risk profile of many others uh, within it as well. Um, and the 5x5 five five agenda of the WHO now, it does include um, mental health and neurological conditions, but dementia is often neglected when, when mental health discussions uh, around um, the 5x5 five five agenda, because it comes mental health is often used as, the, as the, the umbrella term. So that's why I felt it's important to, to highlight the differences there. Um, both um, mental health and neurodegenerative diseases, um, they should be treated as a visible health condition as um, any other condition um, would, would be, a, any other physical ailment as the other speakers have kind of um, alluded to. Um, and I think that comes under the, the UN's leave no one behind agenda. We often see that people are, you know, because you can't see what's, what's happening necessarily, uh, that they are left behind. And so there are important links between dementia and mental health. Um, I think they both are associated with changes in the brain. Uh, both, experience, both groups experience a lot of stigma, um, social exclusion, and also um, limited access to support services. So um, it's very common with, uh, for people who are living with dementia, also for their carers, to experience mental health conditions such as depression and anxiety. And that again has been exacerbated by the current um, crisis. But so when, when you're speaking about dementia and mental health, you're actually, you're not just talking about the 50 million people that have dementia, but also the millions of families and some, um, family supporters who then um, in turn may experience mental health challenges. Um, and as I said, it is important to, to still recognize that dementia does present unique challenges. The fact that it's a progressive condition, the fact that it's age is the biggest risk factor, and the fact um, that obviously there's been a long um, and passionate global advocacy community behind it as well. 
So I just now wanted to speak about the particular challenges that COVID-19 has presented for people living with dementia in terms of their mental health, on top of what they're already experiencing. Um, and so already people living with dementia are more likely to experience isolation, anxiety, stress and depression. Um, and obviously because they're older and they're at higher risk of dying of COVID-19, uh, they've been asked to isolate at home for longer and so this period of isolation is really going to extend for a lot a lot longer and obviously there comes the fear of death of you know knowing that you're in a high-risk group um and that if you if you do end up going to hospital then likelihood is that triage decision making is not going to be in your favor um and we've seen some quite um shocking statistics coming out from some governments uh, we're encouraging more governments to publish this data, but um, particularly the UK and Italy, over 20% of all COVID-19 deaths are people living with dementia, and that's predominantly in long-term care. In Canada, it's as high as 66%. Um, and so ADI has published some, some position papers on um, the scarcity of health resources and triage decision making. Um, and kind of giving some advice to people living with dementia on what they should do potentially staying at home is probably the safer bet. Um, and what's happened during the first lot of lockdowns, um, many dementia diagnostic services have closed down. So obviously that has uh, resulted, we expect, in less diagnosis. Um, people are too afraid, particularly at the beginning of the lockdown, to go into a clinic. And it's probably not the thing that people are is at the top of their priority list looking to to have a diagnosis uh, but we're now seeing um some memory clinics starting to open up again um but yeah it's, it's obviously meant that people can't access say face-to-face -face services which for for things um like dementia is, is very important um and it's harder for obviously older populations to use technology like telemedicine um, and to access the social support. It doesn't really do the same job as, as you would expect from the services they're so used to receiving and, and receiving different types of services as well from different sources. Um, and what we have seen worryingly is that the COVID restrictions have resulted in people's cognitive decline um, going actually faster. And so their dementia is progressing a lot quicker. And I've heard some, you know, accounts from people living with dementia um, and it's, it's really tricky difficult situation on top of everything else um, and obviously all of this including interruption to clinical trials and research um, complications arising around um, new ncds because of covid19 and then the ensuing mental health issues which really should leave us in no doubt that a mental health pandemic is coming and so i wanted to highlight this quote from a very eminent um, advocate who happens to be the CEO and co-founder of Dementia Alliance International, our chair. So she says, in 2020, the rest of the world suddenly experienced what people with dementia and their families experience on a daily basis after diagnosis, such as isolation, distancing from many family and friends, fear, anxiety and stigma. Let's hope that post-COVID, the world takes this new learning and finds ways to reduce the stigma loneliness and isolation we experience and helps to change attitudes towards dementia. So it really just highlights that this is not a moment in history, this is an ongoing challenge and we need to improve the, the access to services and support. Thank you so much. Sorry, I just have um, sorry. a couple slides. Um, oh, sorry, I thought you were wrong. Right. Don't worry. Um, so we do have some really um, Good resources that have come out uh, as a result of the lockdown and the need for extra support. There's been an interagency group led by the WHO mental health team to produce mental health and psychosocial support materials for older people during and post pandemic. Also at the national level there's a really good example we worked closely with the Ministry of Health of Kenya and the mental health uh, unit they've developed a psychological first aid COVID response training um, for healthcare practitioners and that did include a dementia section which was promising. So just to conclude, um, looking ahead, uh, a lot more preparation is needed, not only for pandemics, but also for dementia and mental health. One of the major things that I think has been highlighted is that health and social care systems need to work much better together. Um, and governments must provide mental health and psychosocial support for those who are experiencing bereavement and publish disaggregated mortality data. It's, kind of, it's a matter of, um, of dignity um, and justice for those who have sadly died. Uh, many of whom have dementia. 
And just as losing memory is not a normal part of aging, neither is feeling anxious or depressed. And I think sometimes uh, mental health is seen as like a, a more of a young person's affliction, which is not the case. And so older people should not be left out of the discussion. And aging and discrimination are a huge cause of poor mental health um, among aging adults, as I hope my presentation has highlighted. So just to end on the need for more, 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 um, need more awareness, more research and more investment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ami. That has been very stimulating. Um, we're running a bit out of time, so I may not be able to summarize everything you said, but I'll just, I like the way you positioned dementia and emphasize the fact that um, even when mental health is being talked about, dementia tends to be left out. And um, you, you, used, you brought in the universal health coverage by saying that no one should be left behind and uh, the dementia patients are being left behind. That was very emphatically put across. You also talked about the, 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 the patient's experiences, the isolation, the anxiety, the stress, the depression. And uh, you concluded with a quote from Kate Swaffer, you know, which talks about fear, anxiety, and stigma, and the emphasis you have, uh, you have stressed that government should support dementia patients, and um, the dementia should be taken into cognizance even at the global level, the local level, the national and international level, and you put emphasis on the WHO and the Brain Health Unit of the WHO. Thank you very much, Annie. Once thank more, you. I want to thank all our panelists, our esteemed panelists. We've been really privileged to hear from you all today. Dr. Kanan Subramaniam, uh, Professor Kamal Dibui, and uh, Annie Lee. And um, I really don't know if we have any time to take questions at all, but there's one nagging question that talks about the mental health problem in Africa as it relates to uh, poverty and other things compounding it and illnesses like um, sickle cell disease and so on. I don't know if um, Professor Bui and Annie could quickly in half a minute tackle that question. I think that would be the only question we'll be taking. Um, but my Kawadip is here, our CEO. Um, if he wants to comment also. Thank you very much. Professor um, B and the question and then maybe thank you. Be, uh, Yeah, apologies. I wasn't sure who was gonna uh, go first. Um you of our thank you. Yeah, it's a very important question. I guess it highlights my point earlier that around the world, people living in already precarious situations with low levels of resourcing, low levels of services, low levels of uh, specialist professionals to help are going to suffer the most, not least because uh, perhaps their screening for COVID and other conditions is, isn't as well built. But there's a lot of um, community support and community assets. There's lots of resources in communities that we're not tapping uh, and uh, we need to find different models that work locally. Obviously, the digital revolution is helping uh, and we need to allow localities and people in localities to select solutions that work for them. Increasingly, we know that what works for people is what they recognise will work rather than what comes on down from very high up in policy circles. I mean, I could go on about all the sort of inequalities around ethnicity in, in Africa, but there's an awful lot of brilliant work happening. So we shouldn't see um, uh, uh, this without having a solution as long as it's properly empowered and driven by local communities. Thank you, Professor. We will probably get a written response from you for that question because it's very deep. Um, I mean, just a sentence or two. Um, yeah. I can see our CEO is really in a hurry. We're running out of time. Thank you. Um, yeah, so just to highlight, um, obviously, the I've spoken about the stigma attached to dementia. I think in Sub-Saharan Africa in particular, there is a, a special, um, and particularly in certain countries where um, dementia is seen as witchcraft um, and so that comes with you know physical um, threats to people's safety um, and and I think in terms of the um, healthcare system I think there needs to be a balance of primary and secondary care obviously in certain uh, contexts you don't necessarily have the expertise you don't have gerontologists or you don't have um, mental health workforce but I think um, starting to look at for example, the, the example I gave from the Kenya Ministry of Health, really tying in the way they've kind of linked in mental health and dementia, I think is, is really promising and looking at multimorbidity as well as uh, Professor Bui mentioned. And I also think that um, 
I agree that local solutions may uh, hold the answer, the role of civil society in that respect. Um, and, and ADI has produced a, a report on dementia in sub-Saharan Africa, if anyone wants to read any more on that. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ami. Um, no. Thank you. Okay, th thank you very much to the panelists. I think uh, you've done a great job for us. I think you've highlighted the importance of mental health during this COVID times. And uh, we'll hope to continue talking with you and uh, have a dialogue uh, long term. Uh, it's not yet over, as you say. Uh, we'll have to meet several times <laughs> over the next year to really get this issue sorted out. I would now uh, urge uh, the audience to uh, join the next session, which is really following onto this really prioritizing NCDs. It's absolutely what began this morning with uh, WHO's chief scientists uh, coming on and telling us that we need to look at NCDs uh, as they're happening and during COVID, but also look at the impact uh, COVID will have on access to them. And thank you, everybody, and um, see you at the next session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Subramanian, too. We, we appreciated your presentation. Thank you all. Thank you. Um, I, that rounds up this session. Thank you.